to bless you and the whole world, she's now appeared. So he said, just please take care of her very nicely. So when, of course, when they brought the baby home, his wife, Kirtida, was so happy. And then, actually, they were kind of worried because the baby didn't speak. In fact, she didn't open her eyes. And it seemed like she couldn't hear anything. So they thought, is our baby deaf, dumb, and blind? So they were very concerned. So they all had mixed feelings, and they said, let's not spread the word. Let's just keep it amongst us. Let's keep it secret, and we'll see what happens. So, you know, Narda, he was there for Krishna's appearance. And, you know, he has a big part to play. We won't go into that, but he facilitated Krishna to come quickly. So he, wanted, he realized that sometime now, Radharani is about to appear. So I'm going to try to find her. So he went door to door asking people, did you just have a recently born child? And they said, yeah, we had a son. And he goes, oh, very nice, thank you. And then he went to another place. Oh, yeah, we had a daughter. And then he could see this is an ordinary child. Okay, that's okay. But then he finally went to King Vishrabhanu's house. And he said, oh, did you have a child here recently? Yeah, we have a son. He's, he's a little older. No, I mean, just recently. And he said, yes, we have a daughter. But he's like, what? She's so beautiful, but she doesn't seem to hear anything or speak or see. And he says, never mind, let me go see her. So Nardamuni entered the room where she was, and he saw her and immediately knew that this is her. He just immediately knew, but he needed confirmation. So he told the parents, to, can you please leave the room? I have to do some special prayers to bless the child. So he said, okay. So immediately he paid his obeisances to Radharani. And she actually expanded and came out into her original form, no younger than like teenager, like 13 and a half years or something like that. And he said, she, he was like struck with wonder and, and uh, he was like practically fainted. So Radha came up there, so Narda, do you have anything to say? <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 nothing to say. <laughs> so he was ecstatic and he left, he just like, you know, just circumlaminated and, and just left, he couldn't speak. And he, he told the parents, actually, don't worry about your daughter. Everything will be fine. So he said, just after some time, you know, she's blessed. So, so they said, okay. But he said, you should actually celebrate her birth. You should advertise it wildly all over the village and invite everybody to come. So they said, yeah, let's do that. So, of course, they invited all their friends, and Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda was their dear friend. So they came over, and who did they bring? Baby Krishna. So... They're all, you know, talking about the child and not so happy about certain things. And so Krishna crawled off and he went into the next room and, you know, he couldn't stand up on his own. So he grabbed onto the baby carriage and here he is. You could see him and he saw Radha and he touched her and he, you know, he said something to her in his language, however he could speak. And she opened her eyes and, uh, she, you know, she was so happy and. And she said something in her language back, you know. <laughs> and they were very happy. So, And then she started to cry. So then the parents came and everybody was overjoyed and they celebrated. It was so nice. So um, that's Krishna's birth ceremony. So then eventually they moved and they got, there's a whole story, but we won't go into the whole story about what happened to Radha. She appeared to get married, and, but then they moved away in different places. So this is the beginning. So we could see the love and the chastity that Radharani has for Krishna, that she didn't want to see, hear, or talk about anybody unless she saw Krishna first. So this is, this is his pastime here. So <clears throat> what does this have to do with success? So Gira Swami remem remembers he was having a program at the Birlas in Bombay. The Birlas at that time in India were the most wealthy people of India. And Prabhupada was going there to give a program and he was going to speak. So Girar Swami put together a list of maybe 10 or 20 topics to present to them to ask what they would like to hear. Of course, Prabhupada could speak on anything. So he gave the list to Miss Birla and she scanned the list and she, and, and, she picked out this one topic he, he put down, 
was on how to be successful. So it kind of struck Giraswami. And these are the kind of people you think they're already successful. And he had the understanding that, okay, if they wanted more, to hear more about success, it means that they want more. And it indicated that they weren't satisfied, you see. And there's so many rich people we know that how it is. In the 1960s, who was the richest person? John Paul Getty. And they asked him, he was the richest man in the world. They asked him, what is, his, what is your philosophy of life? Can you summarize it in one word? And he said, yes, more. So you could see this is what they think success is. But what did Prabhupada say in the lecture, what success was? Success means to transfer ourselves from the material energy, Durga, the material world, to the control of the spiritual energy. And who's that represented by? Srimati Radharani. So this material world is very difficult to overcome. In the Bhagavad Gita describes that it's very difficult. But if you surrender to Krishna, then all these things become very, very easy. So in the purport, Sri Prabhupada writes to that purport to that verse. And we're going to go into these different energies he's going to describe here. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has innumerable energies and all these energies are divine. Although the living ent entities are part of his energies and are therefore divine, due to contact with material energy, their original superior power is covered. Being thus covered by material energy, one cannot possibly overcome its influence. As previously stated, both the material and spiritual natures, being emanations from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, are eternal. The living entities belong to the eternal superior nature of the Lord. But due to contamination by the inferior nature, matter, their illusion is also eternal. The conditioned soul, therefore, is called Nitya Bada, or eternally conditioned. No one can trace out the history of his becoming conditioned at a certain date in material history. Consequently, his release from the clutches of material nature is very difficult, even though that material nature is an inferior energy, because material nature is ultimately conducted by the supreme will, which a living entity cannot overcome. Inferior material nature is defined herein as divine nature, due to its divine connection and movement by the divine will. Being conducted by the divine will, material nature, although inferior, acts so wonderfully in the construction and destruction of the cosmic manifestation. So these modes are very difficult to overcome, but if we surrender to Krishna, we can actually overcome them very easily. And how do we do that? by surrendering to Krishna. We have to surrender through someone who surrendered to Krishna. And that's called a Mahatma. A Mahatma is one who surrendered to Krishna. Giraswami also recalls, he said, in 1973, there was a prominent Indian gentleman and he approached Srila Prabhupada and he said, you know, India has so many Mahatmas, but it's suffering so much. And Prabhupada says, that is because you do not know what is a Mahatma. A Mahatma is one who's fully engaged in the service of the Lord and he doesn't divert his attention to anything else. No deviation of mind. That's the stage we want to aspire to. And the blessings, by the blessings of Radharani, it can become possible. So did you know that Krishna can whistle? Of course, we can whistle. Whatever we can do it comes from Krishna. But actually he chooses his flute to make beautiful sounds because he can make more tones and notes with a flute, isn't it? He has a musical instrument. So this is what he does. So he expands himself into so many wonderful living entities also just for his enjoyment. And this is his Sat, Chit, and Ananda. And this, he expands himself also as Srimati Radharani. And it's so nicely described. There's a, this is from a wonderful book. I'll explain about it later. And Krishna is actually 
approached Radharani in the disguise as a beautiful demigoddess. And he's asking her, How, can you explain your, this love that you have? Can you explain it to me? Can Help me understand it. So this is one thing she said. We're going to more. The common conception is that I am always in the heart of Krishna. And he's always in my heart. And that we have a complete meeting of minds. We completely understand each other. Don't believe this. This is not true. This is a mistake. Here is the real fact. In a lake, there is a lotus plant. And from the root of that plant, two flowers are growing. One blue and one yellow. Those two flowers are not different from each other because they have one root. In the same way, my blue cloth signifies the color of Krishna's body. And his yellow cloth signifies the color of my body. There is no difference between us at all. We are one soul. And that for the sake of tasting our astonishing pastimes, we take two forms. So this is Radha Krishna. So go into more. This is very esoteric philosophy. <laughs> and to understand it takes some... Um, <clears throat> so we're going to... This is a blueprint of the spiritual material creation. Someone did this nice graphic. I always use this. It's so... I like to always use this as a blueprint to help me understand the philosophy. I don't know if you can actually see, but there's uh, different descriptions here of the material and spiritual worlds. And it has the three different energies that are described. We see here, as I mentioned, Sat, which is Krishna's eternal energy. And it's actually Balaram expands there, expands into all the spiritual energy, material world, spiritual worlds. And there's the Chit, the knowledge factor. And there's the Ananda. And this is Radharani. So... There's a very nice uh, purports by Srila Prabhupada in the Ali Lila, the confidential reasons of Lord Chaitanya's appearance. So there's some nice uh, excerpts I'd like to just share with you. In his thesis, Bhagavad Sandarbha, Srila Jiva Goswami explains the potencies of the Lord as follows. The transcendental potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by which he maintains his existence is called Sandini. This is the Sat. The transcendental potency in which he knows himself and causes others to know him is called sambit, that's the chit. And the transcendental potency by which, he, by which he possesses transcendental bliss and causes his devotees to have bliss is called hladini, that's his ananda potency there. The total exhibition of these potencies is called visuddha sattva. And this platform of spiritual variegatedness is displayed even in the material world when the Lord appears here. So this is all above the mundane manifestations. And uh, <clears throat> this is very transcendental. So it goes on here. Each of the three divisions of the internal potency, the Samdini, Samvit, and Hadidi energies, influences one of the external potencies by which the conditioned souls are conducted. The influence manifests the three qualitative modes of material nature, providing definitely that the living entities, the marginal potency, are eternal servitors of the Lord and are therefore controlled by either the internal or the external potency. So this is what we mentioned earlier, what it means to be really successful, is that we want to put ourselves under that internal energy. So Prabhupada says here in another purport, to make this more clear, it may be said that this Sadini Shakti or the internal potency maintains and manifests all the variegatedness of the spiritual world in the kingdom of God. The Lord's servants and maidservants, his consorts, his father and mother, and everything else are all transformations of the spiritual existence of the Sandini Shakti. The existential Sandini Shakti in the external potency similarly expands all the variegatedness of the material cosmos from which can give a glimpse of the spiritual field. So there's so much more to go on. 
and it talks more about the Ladini Shakti, love of God, and how it's Srimati Radharani, and that Krishna cannot enjoy anything that is internally different from himself. So therefore, actually, Radha and Krishna are identical. So it goes on. But here we'll describe more. Just in one of these lines, as we mentioned, this Sri Radhika, or this uh, Ladini potency, it expands into different forms, as we mentioned. And it also into the Pramananda, the pure love of God. There's so much variety there. So here, as it descends, all this energy is as we come lower into the lower planetary systems and spiritual planets, this Ladini potency expands as Mahalakshmi and billions of other Lakshmis. And even we see it, Parvati, she expands as Parvati, the wife of Lord Shiva. And also the Brahmananda, the all-pervading impersonal bliss. And then we'll see here, as it goes down again, actually as Durga Devi, the shadow of the Ladini Shakti. And even the material pleasure that we experience is an expansion of this Ladini potency. So this is very wonderful. So here we are. And this is actually Mother Earth is an expansion of Radharani. So we're very fortunate. She's our mother. So as we know, the bewildered they take shelter of the material nature. But the material nature is like a fortress. It's like a prison. And there's a warden with a trident. You can see the trident. And she actually pierces the demons by the threefold miseries. We have these threefold miseries here in the material world. But we know the Mahatmas, they take shelter of the divine nature. And that's Srimati Radharani, the success of life. So it's described that Krishna had two main desires when he wanted to appear. There's many, there's others described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. But he, did, he uh, men mentioned it just in two at first. It's the Lord wanted to taste the sweet essence of the mallows of love of God. And he wanted to propagate devotional service in the material world. But as we find out, foolish people, they don't understand when Krishna appears. They actually don't know his transcendental nature. So they try to speculate and try to figure out Krishna and their mundane. It's like they have all head and no heart. They have no love. So Prabhupada <clears throat> explains in many places how this loving sentiment can only be understood by those who take shelter of the Mahatmas. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada actually emphasized that a devotee eligible to hear Radha Krishna Lila must clearly understand Krishna to be the supreme being who is engaged in super mundane pastimes with his own internal potencies. If such an understanding is fixed, a devotee or even the general public may hear this Radha Krishna Lila. So this is the potency of it. Just by hearing about it, we become purified. So it descends. This knowledge is descended. And such pastimes, they purify us and they attract us. And this is what he's doing. He's actually showing himself. He's displaying himself to all, everyone in the mature world. And hopefully, by reading this information, they will, they will become pious and they will take shelter of that spiritual energy. Because in the material energy, they're being pierced by the trident of Kali and Durga Devi. So it's Durga Devi's expansion. But those who engage in sense gratification, they can hardly understand this Radha Bhava, this transcendental knowledge. So therefore, we have to actually take this attitude of Srimati Radharani as being a servant. And then we could go back and we can actually become enlightened. You see, we become Dira by hearing Radha Krishna Lila. Prabhupada says in the Krishna book, if they simply hear about Krishna, they become relieved of the material disease. They are addicted to material enjoyment and they're accustomed to reading sex literature. But by hearing these transcendental pastimes of Krishna with the gopis, they will be relieved of material contamination. So though them trying to understand these uh, people all in the head, trying to philosophically understand and speculate about Krishna, they actually try to impose their own mundane 
religious principles on Krishna. But actually, if you analyze, children was only eight years old when Krishna was playing with, with the gopis. So we see when young children are playing, younger boys are playing freely together and they're innocent. So we can see that's one thing you can explain to them, some people think, because Krishna is actually the bhokta, his enjoyer. And we're bhokja, which is the enjoyed. So Krishna is the enjoyer, the purusha, and we're the prakriti, the enjoyed. So sometimes Krishna comes and he enjoys his different energies. And this is one of the things that they try to criticize Krishna. Is they see him, you know, playing with the gopis. In fact, the gopis pray to Katyani to have Krishna as their husband. So Krishna fulfilled that desire here. So we can see that this is just like, who are these gopis he's playing with? They're actually liberated souls. They have spiritual bodies. They're the internal energy of Krishna. You see? And it's like Krishna is trying to enjoy a reflection in the mirror. You see, the, this material world is a perverted reflection of the supreme sky. But actually, these pastimes are going on there. And it's like Krishna is just looking at himself and his own self. It's like a reflection. You see? But in the spiritual world, it's the pinnacle of spiritual bliss. But here, it's just the opposite. It's the lowest. All the mundane sense gratification. So there's great personalities like Madhavacharya, Ramuna Jacharya, Nibarka Acharya, hundreds and thousands of great exalted personalities. They also see Krishna's pastimes as very pure and very spiritual. In fact, they worship him, they study him. You know, and these are great celibates, great us, us, you know, perform great austerities. Even the six Goswamis, there's wonderful prayers, you know, of the of the six Goswamis offering uh, their prayers to the gopis and they spend their time studying the activities of the gopis and even Lord Brahma he prayed to become a blade of grass at the feet of the gopis in Vrindavan and he's a great personality even Narada Muni in order to experience the pastimes of the gopis with Krishna he had a dip take a dip in the Kusum Sarovya to become a Narada gopi and even Lord Shiva, he had to dip in the Jamuna to change his form as Gopeshvara, as the servant in the Rasa dance. And this is him. You could tell because there's a snake at his feet, at her feet, <laughs> there. So even the demigods, you could see above in the sky, they're on these swan airplanes. They can only watch at a distance. They can't actually get very close. Actually, they could just offer flowers as they're doing in this image. And we can see that Lord Krishna had his dear friend, Uddhava. In fact, there's 23 chapters in the 11th canto which describes the Uddhava Gita. But even before that, Krishna, his first lesson for Uddhava was to make him aware of the gopi's position. So he sent him to Vrindavan to learn about their position. And he was just stunned. In fact, he was so amazed, spellbound especially with Radharani. So this was nice. So he, he sent him there so that he could gain this knowledge, take it back to Mathura and Dwarka, and even to spread this now throughout the entire world. So just as Radhika became mad at the sight of Uddhava, Lord Chaitanya was also obsessed day and night by the madness of separation from Krishna. So it's described here that the Sahajas, they take meeting Krishna very cheaply but actually, the attitude of separation of taught by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is even higher. So Lord Chaitanya even dreamed about the gopis. And he was a great sannyasi, a strict celibate in his later times. He was just completely absorbed in the spiritual activities. And you can see here, his witnessing all these activities. You can see him in the trees. He's dreaming about Krishna. And he's seeing Krishna playing with the gopis in the, in the waters. He's standing there at the bank and just experiencing this and worshiping it. He's so amazed. So, this morning we heard a lecture by Srila Prabhupada in, in L.A. And he was talking about how 
that if we actually read this knowledge, we understand it and try to understand Krishna, which is very difficult. But if you actually hear from the Mahatmas, it becomes easier and easier. And you'll be able to understand Krishna very nicely. And um, there's a nice section here where Prabhupada says that um, just as the sun is rising and setting, it's decrease, decreasing the life of everyone. But if you hear and chant, spend your time hearing the glories of Krishna, then it makes you immortal. You actually become uh, free from this birth and death. So Bhagavad Gita is very important. And uh, all these different books that we have, Krishna book, also, it's described here in Krishna book. Prabhupada says, when as soon as they see this book, they wonder, who is this Krishna? And who is this girl with Krishna? So today is to, we, an opportunity to learn about this girl. And we have to focus our attention on Radha, Radha Krishna. This is our, our meditation. And so the Srimad Bhagavatam is actually a literary incarnation of Krishna. And this is what we have. So now it's time for the Arctic. And there's more. So thank you for your kind attention. And please take advantage of reading these transcendental literatures. Hare Krishna. Jai. Shri Prabhupada Ki